Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Sevier Sudakov. I'm a solution architect for Moxa's Asia Pacific and Taiwan regions. So before we get started, I wanted to share a couple of important notes with you. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the questions panel to submit them and our panelists will address your inquiries. Also, at the end of the webinar, you will get a short survey and we would really appreciate it if you can take a moment to answer a few brief questions and let us know how you found today's session. So with that said, I think we are ready to start. The webinar is titled Cybersecurity Below Industrial DMZ. And uh, hopefully it's a start of webinar series about OT cybersecurity. So uh, you can consider this as an introduction presentation for OT people about solutions that they may need to implement and work with. Here is the agenda for today's session. I will quickly explain the context of OT cybersecurity and uh, then we will talk about most common solutions in the market discuss key features, the pros and cons, and finally, I'll briefly tell you how Moxa relates to this topic. First, I would like to explain why I named this webinar Cybersecurity Below Industrial DMZ. Back in the days, OT systems, uh, they were isolated from IT systems and mainly used highly proprietary components so the cybersecurity risk was minimal. Later, with the advancement of technologies and higher adoption of uh, common IT tools in OT environments, the air gap disappeared. To manage cybersecurity risks related to convergence of these two worlds of IT and OT, people usually installed a firewall, and if they followed best practices, they create an industrial DMZ between the OT and IT networks. In uh, simple terms, it is a dedicated area that acts like a buffer. IDMZ devices are allowed to collect information from OT applications and then share it with IT services. No direct communication between OT and IT is allowed. This is a best practice for connecting OT to IT, since it minimizes the risk related to direct connection of the two. In my experience, uh, when a cybersecurity enhancement project is led by IT people, forming an IDMZ is where OT cybersecurity begins, and unfortunately, in many cases, it also ends there. The reason is simple, uh, OT environments are too alien for IT folks, so they don't fully understand what the risks are and how to deal with OT equipment. Moreover, OT personnel usually don't want to make any changes to their systems, especially if they don't understand how newly introduced solutions operate. Nevertheless, uh, that understanding gap has to be fixed because just having an IDMZ is not enough anymore. There are actually many methods to infiltrate a network that wouldn't require an attacker to go through an IDMZ. Following the defense in depth concept, we don't want to rely on IDMZ as the only protective measure for OT. Here are some attack vectors on OT. Removable media, uh, this is an obvious one. We carry them around, plug into different computers to import, export projects, get logs, and so on. Uh, it could be infected elsewhere, then brought into an OT environment. Another common problem is unauthorized connections by in-house engineers or contractors they may directly connect their laptop into an OT network to perform maintenance or simply to, to, to charge their phone through USB port of an OT workstation. 
since that external equipment is not trusted, it could carry some malicious software. Also, there are many cases when engineers leave remote access to OT equipment to perform tasks without visiting the site. That could be a cellular gateway or even a laptop with remote desktop service. The supply chain itself could be compromised. Device firmware could be replaced in transition, for example. In other words, there are plenty of reasons why we should care about cybersecurity inside OT and not relying on IDMZ only. Can proper levels of cybersecurity be established quickly? Um, unfortunately not. It is a long journey and moreover, it is not just a one-time project. It is a continuous process that requires continuous efforts. To make this process easier to understand, we can refer to this maturity model. Uh, it has several incremental levels associated with typical countermeasures for each level. You can see how as maturity builds up from left to right, the requirements of the most precious resources of the human workforce and its expertise also builds up. You can't simply buy the most fancy solution and make it work without a dedicated OT cybersecurity team. Today, we will mainly focus on the first three levels and solutions for them, because this is where you want to start your cybersecurity journey. And this is where you find OT specific tools that have to be installed in the field, which may directly impact operations. Standards are good reference points when you don't know where to start and cybersecurity is not an exception. So it has its own standards. The most famous one and probably most comprehensive for general OT applications is ISA IEC 62443. You may have heard about this standard from both vendors and asset owners because it defines how cybersecurity should be implemented in OT. What is uh, its life cycle? What are the requirements for all parties and many more? However, some industries such as power, marine, as well as oil and gas, require a tailored approach, so there are additional industry-specific guidelines. And the last thing I want to mention before we jump into solutions overview is types of countermeasures. There are two big categories, built-in and bolt-on. Guess which one is better? Of course, built-in. Built-in means that developers of the system took serious consideration of cybersecurity and implemented embedded protection. Here are several examples of built-in security mentioned in the standards. ISA IEC 62443-4-2 states that to achieve a certain level of security, a device should have a hardware root of trust that can be used to verify firmware and ensure configuration integrity. Device functionality should include role-based access with capabilities of centralized account management. Another example is from IEC 62351, which says that messages between ID and SCADA should be encrypted and messages on a process level should be digitally signed. So the built-in approach reduces risk on a very fundamental system component level. But ask yourself, how many devices in the field have a good level of built-in security? Probably very few. We still have many legacy devices that weren't designed with cybersecurity in mind, and I don't think we can afford to replace them all anytime soon. That's why we have to rely on bolt-on or additional cybersecurity measures. Those are tools that are installed to enhance the cybersecurity of existing system. 
you heard a, a lot about uh, firewalls, antivirus software, intrusion detection systems. They are all examples of bolt-on security controls. When you are picking a product for your system, in case of built-in security, it's pretty straightforward. Just ask your vendor for standard compliance or ask them to provide you with a compliance matrix that allows you to meet your desired set of requirements. And since it is a native device feature, everything should work smoothly. Uh, for bolt-on solutions, it's more difficult to make an optimal choice. That's why for the rest of presentation, I will talk more about which bolt-on solutions are common for OT and what things you have to consider when you are choosing one. So let's dive into it. I will use this simplified OT architecture to show you where cybersecurity countermeasures can be installed. Right now, there is no protection and we are going to add it layer by layer. To keep it simple, I have divided countermeasures into four groups. First, and probably the most obvious thing, is that we need to protect our hosts or devices. Because in most attacks, they are the final targets. The network forms the backbone of the system that enables communication between devices. Therefore, access to the network has to be restricted in order to prevent an attacker from reaching devices and executing various network-based attacks. Since networks might be a large scale and connect multiple systems, it is important to manage this shared infrastructure properly. Uh, we can restrict data flows through network segmentation and establish secure communication channels. And finally, it's a good idea to enable security related visibility and detect threats to be able to react properly and prevent attacks, or at least minimize the impact. Let's take a look at each category in more details, starting with device security. We protect our personal and office computers with antivirus software, or if antivirus software is combined with additional features, we call it endpoint protection. Modern OT computers are very similar to personal computers, so the same approach can be used here. The general idea is very simple. Uh, we try to lock operation of the computer to a predefined list of actions. So anything outside of that list would be rejected, or at minimum, it would require additional authorization. I actually think this approach works even better for OT computers, since their functions are very limited to supporting OT system operations. We don't install random pieces of software or browse the internet on SCADA machines, right? So what exactly can we lock down? Industrial computers have ports to connect peripheral devices such as USB, and those ports could be attack vectors, remember? Endpoint protection can lock physical ports and allow it to be used only for limited devices that have passed authentication or if their device ID is listed as approved. To protect from network-related attacks, endpoint protection usually provides a host-based firewall that can lock communications to only necessary connections. Also, configuration or system settings can be locked, like IP settings or wireless network settings. What we don't want to see on an industrial PC is execution of unnecessary or even harmful applications. To prevent that, uh, endpoint protection can lock services and programs to a predefined list again. Uh, this will help with some malware types and unauthorized applications executed by employees. Another good idea is to lock critical files from changes. Those files could be SCADA projects or PLC configurations. 
And lastly, there is still a need for antivirus functionality because malware can mimic legitimate processes or if it's a virus, it can infect system executables. So locking by itself might not be sufficient and regular scanning needs to be performed. Referring to our diagram, we can apply endpoint protection to OT computers like engineer workstations, SCADA servers, and clients, and other application servers. The question is, can we directly apply the same endpoint protection that we use on our laptop in IT environment? I think there are two problems here. First, uh, we still have a lot of Windows 7 and uh, even Windows XP computers in OT. So operating system may not be supported by vendor and IT grade and protection solutions, they do not support legacy systems as well. So that's why OT grade endpoint protection would include the compatibility with a wide range of legacy systems like Windows XP and T 2003 and some versions of Linux. The second issue with applying IT-based solutions is their impact on the performance of a computer. I still remember times when I had to take a coffee break while antivirus performed scanning of my laptop because it became much slower than usual. So when OT computer is running a critical process control task, we cannot accept that kind of performance downgrade and slow response time. So another feature of OT grade endpoint protection should be a minimal footprint. Some vendors go beyond stating memory and CPU consumption in their data sheet, and they actually test their product with major SCADA brands to verify compatibility and ensure that there is no impact to performance. I would say that uh, Endpoint protection is a good bolt-on security control. However, we need to carefully consider the side effects on the system. Also, sometimes uh, due to the warranty terms of system supplier, it is prohibited to install such software. So we have to choose other ways of protecting. Uh, and last, if the endpoint protection has an ultimalware component, uh, we also need to consider how to deliver signature updates, uh, whether we place an update server in the DMZ or uh, if we deliver updates manually on USB stick or by any other method. So if for some reason we can't install endpoint protection on OT computer, or if we want to protect a device with proprietary architecture, what can we do? That kind of OT device for us is essentially a black box. We may not know how it operates, but unfortunately we may find that someone else already discovered its security issues and published security advisories. If we can't patch the device, if we can't install additional protection inside, the only way is to place protection outside on the network link. Usually that would be inline protection or an intrusion prevention system. Functions that can be used to protect uh, would include communication whitelisting, such as firewall, and probably with industrial protocol awareness, and another function is virtual patching. This is used instead of applying a patch on a device. Uh, we can drop packets related to exploitation of a known vulnerability instead. It's almost like an antivirus protection applied on packets instead of files. It is also based on signatures, so network-based anti-malware, it kind of comes as a bonus. We can place an IPS in front of a PLC, DCS, and HMI devices on our diagram. That's because usually they have a proprietary architecture. 
I mentioned that an OT-grade IPS should have deep packed inspection that supports industrial protocols. We should be able to specify whitelisting on a deeper level, not just allowing entire application protocols such as Mobus, Profinet, or even IP. But we should be able to specify the particular commands, device IDs, registers that are allowed. Regarding virtual patching, a vendor should provide signatures for OT-related vulnerabilities, not just general purpose ID threat signatures. The benefits of such IPS is that it can be applied to almost any asset without reconfiguring the system. So it's ideal for brownfield projects. As usual, we need to carefully consider the impact and be aware that any additional component on your network will inevitably increase latency. For IPS and firewalls that both use software-based packet processing, latency could be a real issue. So this kind of protection is usually not applicable to time-sensitive devices and protocols. And uh, speaking of protocols, this is still a relatively new industry and a single vendor may not be able to provide DPI for all the protocols you need. And it is actually often uh, that the protocol support may actually be the major decision factor. As with any active protection measure, there is a chance of blocking legitimate traffic, especially when it comes to signature-based methods. Therefore, extensive testing has to be done before applying any solutions in a production environment. As with endpoint protection, uh, we also may need to arrange a delivery of signature updates to perform virtual patching of newly discovered vulnerabilities. So again, uh, that would require updating uh, infrastructure and procedures. And finally, once we put a device between an asset and the network, we need to make sure that it will not become a single point of failure. Such devices should have redundant power or even better to have a bypass mechanism that would allow communication if there is a protection failure. So uh, these two types of bolt-on cybersecurity solutions are the most common for device security. Uh, we covered endpoint protection software and IPS. Now let's move to uh, network protection. There are two essential functions in managed Ethernet switches that can limit network access, port security and ACL. The idea is very simple. Port security verifies that only authorized devices can be plugged into a switch. And ACL verifies that only authorized communication takes place for authorized devices. As usual, the devil is in the details. How exactly can we authenticate a device or a user? We could use credentials for verification but that will require extra capability that OT devices usually do not have. So people usually end up using MAC addresses as device ID and maintain a database of valid MACs either on network access server or locally on a switch. As for ACL, um, it acts like a simple firewall it has less functionality, but also it has a very important advantage. ACL is a hardware-based filtering mechanism. That means that it doesn't affect bandwidth or latency. So uh, we can argue that these features are more similar to built-in security on Ethernet switches, but I think it's important to highlight because in my experience, there are many asset owners who do have this functionality in their network devices, but simply do not enable it. Also, it is relatively simple to replace a switch in a working system comparing to upgrading a PLC, for example. 
So here is port security and ACL on our diagram. If done on a large scale, these features would require certain infrastructure to support centralized management of access policies, user device databases, and event logs. So keep this in mind when you are considering to deploy these features. Also, any security enhancement may cause inconvenience. Uh, using the example of field device replacement procedure, if you don't have port security, you can simply swap an old device with a new one. But if there is a port security in place, you need to add the MAC address to of the new device into the database first. So there would be an extra maintenance time to get this, this extra security. When it comes to secure infrastructure, the key topic is network segmentation. This concept is mentioned in all cybersecurity standards because it includes the very fundamental principle of dividing something big into smaller pieces to make it more manageable. Let's have a simple example. On this diagram, the OT system is large scale and there are several subsystems that all connect to the supervisory level. If we refer to IEC 62443 terminology, to do network segmentation, we need to establish security zones. In this example, it makes sense to put each subsystem and control center into separate security zones. The actual definition of a security zone is a group of assets that share the same security requirements. Once we have zones, we will also have conduits between them, which are cross-zone communication channels. And the key component that we need to add into an OT system while performing segmentation would be a firewall. So let's get back to our simplified diagram. Uh, this is where we can put a firewall to perform network segmentation. The best practice is to perform whitelisting using a firewall, which means that we are allowing a limited list of only necessary communications and blocking everything else. And again, the more precise we can define proper communication, the better. Therefore, deep packed inspection of industrial protocols is one of the key features of OT grade firewalls, apart from rugged hardware. Nowadays, firewalls, uh, they embrace more and more additional functionalities that were originally separate protection measures. You may have heard the term NG firewall or next generation firewall, which simply means that apart from core stateful traffic, traffic inspection, the device has extra features such as network address translation, signature based protection, and so on. And uh, what makes network segmentation a bit difficult is the fact that in most cases, we need to change IP addresses of OT system components. Because ideally, every zone should have its dedicated address space, which requires reconfiguration of network parameters on end devices. Of course, alternatively, we can keep old addresses and use NAT to prevent overlapping, but this adds another level of complexity to the network. Um, actually, anyway, after segmentation, network gets more complicated, so it will require more administration efforts. Another thing that I would like to discuss for secure infrastructure is remote access. By remote access, I mean any communication within or with an OT system that is happening over a public network. It's a bit controversial topic and usually cybersecurity people do not like it. The reality, however, is that there are so many cases when remote access gives huge benefits or is simply unavoidable. Uh, when these scenarios arise, it has to be done as securely as possible. I'll give you a couple of popular scenarios for remote access. The first one is when an OT system is geographically distributed. 
So previously, back in the days, we used leased lines to connect remote sites to control center. But now it's not so attractive anymore, especially from financial point of view. So more and more asset owners, they rely on VPN connectivity on top of the internet. Of course, it has to be reliable and uh, probably with some form of redundancy when you use uh, more than one uh, ISP and in addition, all the VPN gateways, they have to comply with field installation requirements. And uh, the second scenario for remote access is an access to a particular asset. This could be required for technical support or IIoT applications when we need to collect data for analysis. The main challenge for this scenario is how to have minimum infrastructure investments and to keep it manageable and easy to use. We certainly don't want to punch a hole through all of our firewalls to establish a connection from outside to certain devices. A popular choice is a dedicated VPN solution that has, for example, a cellular internet access. And uh, usually it is also cloud-based, so we can avoid the whole public-private IP issues. It is important to note that if we are building an on-demand tunnel, there should be ways for the asset owner to control when remote access is allowed and when it is not. So here is uh, remote access on our diagram. You will see more and more demand for remote access driven by the work from home initiative and IoT applications, such as predictive maintenance. My advice is to keep it visible. Whenever the remote access is established, facility staff should be aware of it. And of course, all of the related risks have to be evaluated carefully and mitigated with a proper solution. And the last piece of the puzzle for field level OT security is threat detection. If we can get a copy of all network packets from OT, fit it into a powerful intrusion detection system that has deep packet inspection, machine learning, threat signatures, and information about devices, we can actually solve two problems. First, we can get notifications about potential attacks so we can react accordingly. And second, we can also verify which devices are actually on our network and what are they transmitting. Due to the passive nature of network IDS and the fact that most OT systems in production, they do not have up-to-date inventory, these kinds of solutions are very popular now. There are many companies that have an IDS tailored for OT. In fact, IDS is already included in many standards as an essential cybersecurity countermeasure. Here it is on our diagram. I would like to warn you, though, that there are several complications related to IDS implementation that may not be obvious at first sight. It's actually not so easy to collect mirror traffic. First, you need to have managed switches with mirroring capabilities. Second, you need to deliver the mirror traffic to the IDS server. I heard some people put their hopes on remote mirroring features, also called RSpan. But in my opinion, there is a very high risk of overwhelming the network with mirror traffic and impacting original communications. So I think the best way is to build a separate network to deliver mirrored packets. Alternatively, you can limit the monitoring points to selected network junctions and give up trying to see everything. The most critical factor for IDS effectiveness is actually how the events are processed. Ideally, there should be a SIM system which will correlate events from different devices into one logical series and a team which will constantly monitor and respond to these events. 
As previously mentioned in the maturity model, IDS is kind of an advanced solution which requires more human resources to operate. Now that we covered solutions for OT cybersecurity, you can see how packed our topology became with protection. This is not a complete map of what's available on the market by any means, but I hope I covered the major things and I gave you a comprehensive overview of this topic. Implementing even part of this is definitely a great enhancement for OT cybersecurity. And to wrap this up, uh, I would like to quickly share with you how Moxa product portfolio maps to this concept. We don't have endpoint protection, uh, but we do have an industrial IPS that is called EtherCache, as well as transparent firewalls to protect OT assets, uh, such as PLC, HMI, RTU, ID, and so on. And our core business is still in industrial connectivity, so you can find a variety of Ethernet switches that have port security and ACL. We also have wireless infrastructure components and serial device servers with extra security features. To help build secure network infrastructure, we provide both next generation firewalls with IPS functionality and routers with security features. We do have VPN gateways, including cellular versions and cloud-based remote access solutions. As of now, there is no OT IDS in our portfolio yet, but please feel free to ask us about networking solutions to support IDS deployment. We have experience integrating OT IDS with our network devices. And last, uh, we do provide software to manage all of our products, which includes network management system with security posture assessment and a centralized device management tool. To get more details, you can check out our webinars, visit our website, www.moxa.com, or simply get in touch with our partner in your region. I think that wraps up our webinar for today. I would like to really thank you for your attention and hope to see you next time. Uh, there are still some unanswered questions left. Uh, I think we will follow them up and reply you by email. Also, once we close this webinar, you will see a shared survey in your browser. Please take a moment to give us your valuable feedback. So thank you again and uh, have a nice day.